Let's get you to the weekend. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Your equity market on the S&P 500 pulling back just a touch on the S&P. We're down two tenths of 1%. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, coming up, it was a November to remember for the equity bulls. With rate cut hopes fueling a monster everything rally, Chair Powell getting his say before the Fed goes quiet. We begin with the big issue. Chair Powell, up next. Chair Powell. Jerome Powell. He sits down for that fireside chat. Chair Powell's going to hedge a little bit and say, we're not talking about cuts here. The debate right now is when are they going how many months is it before they contemplate lowering rates? The bar for the Fed to cut rates is going is high. The hurdle is still high here with inflation in the three and a half, four percent range. We need that inflation convincingly closer to two percent. Unemployment rate needs to start moving materially higher. The Fed starts to change its tune once you see a sub 100K uh, payroll print. There's an element of we don't want the market to get too ahead of itself. Powell is trying and failing to teach the market, you know, a little bit of patience. The markets are hearing what they want to hear. The Fed has a very high incentive to continue to keep another rate hike on the table. They don't want to extract uh, a, you know, a loss from the jaws of victory. They're going to be happy to just buy time, wait for data. The Fed doesn't know where they're, what they're going to do next. Joining us now to discuss TPW's Jay Piloski, Mike Schumacher, Wells Fargo. Gents, let's get straight into it. Jay, any reason for Chairman Powell to push back today? No, look, um, John, we think the Fed is uh, increasingly in the rearview mirror, less and less important. We're switching globally from a monetary policy-led regime to a fiscal policy-led regime, and we expect the, the Fed to become a frenemy of market. So not an enemy anymore. Rate hikes are done, uh, but not fully a friend because we're not really sure where the Fed stands. But in our view, the next moves for the Fed are going to be rate cuts, and not because we're going into recession, but because inflation has fallen fast enough and far enough such that it gives them room to cut and provide insurance policy for risk assets. Mike Schumacher, do you agree? Uh, actually, no. As far as the Fed today, John, I'll take the other side. We think Powell pushes back. And the reason is financial conditions have eased far too quickly. You mentioned at the outset in November to remember, that's right, stocks rocking, bonds ripping. These are not great things for the Fed. So the challenge for Jay Powell today is to say we're going to keep rates high, not maybe higher, but high for quite some time. So he'll push back a bit, I think. Jay, why isn't this a premature easing of financial conditions? Because uh, inflation is falling, John. Look, we put out our 2024 outlook over a month ago now, and uh, one of our four macro surprises was lower than expected inflation sooner than expected. And we got the October number to set us off on this November to remember. We got PCE yesterday running at an annualized rate of exactly 2%. We had European inflation year over year of 2.4%. This is a global issue. Supply chain pressures, which is a big factor for the inflation we saw over the last year and a half or so, have eased completely. Record low supply chain pressures, according to the New York Fed. And so the Fed does not need to do anything. So, sure, today, maybe he pushes back a little bit. That's meaningless to me. I'm not looking at the day-to-day -day trading. I'm looking at the next 6 to 12 months. And what I see over the next 6 to 12 months is a return to macro stability, in part because of that lower than in expected inflation, sooner than expected. And that sets up a great environment for risk assets, particularly outside the United States. It's four minutes into the show. We're all friends. I don't want you to fight. But Mike Schumacher, why is Jay wrong? <laughs> I think as far as the, the outlook for rate cuts happening, that's probably right. But it's a question of how quickly. And markets, since we all tend to have ADD in this business, are looking for the next rate cut. Take your pick by the Fed, the ECB, whomever, to be pretty quick. And that's unlikely. So. That's why I think when you look at market pricing, for instance, with the Fed being priced to ease, what, 45 basis points, give or take, by the middle of next year, a lot of that probably gets pushed back into the second half of the year. 
So the way we look at it is rates stay high for a while and then come down starting toward the middle of the year. So I think patience is the word yet. It's not really going to be a quick move down from here in yields. Yields have already fallen a lot. So I think people who are looking at another 50 to 75 basis point move lower in bond yields over the next few months are likely to be disappointed. The Let's Fed and other central banks want to try and, and avoid that. I want to get to the professional in the building, and it's not me, it's Mike McKee. Mike McKee has to follow Fed speak for us. Mike McKee, anything different from Chairman Powell later than what we got from Governor Waller earlier this week? I don't think so. I'd like to throw him in the middle of this discussion here because I like seeing these guys fight. I mean, it, it makes life much more interesting on a Friday. Uh, here's what we're seeing out there, and this is why it's become such a topic. What is Jay going to say today? The rate cut frenzy is really building in the markets. You can see in the last couple of days, how much people have priced in the idea of the first rate cut in uh, May and then in June, look where we are, two rate cuts in a row there. We get to five by January of 2025. At least that's what the markets are thinking today. And they've been encouraged, of course, by members of the Fed who have basically given us the message that they're done. Some have said, yes, absolutely, we're done. You can see that uh, Bostic and Harker have said that. But as the sorting out puts them into different categories, uh, really everybody's not that far apart. Now, you can see I've got uh, Jay Powell in the maybe but category, and I'm going to give you the two-handed economist answer to your question, John, about what Powell's going to do. He's going to have it both ways because he wants to keep the idea of uh, rate uh, increases on the table, but not encourage people to price in too much more. So he'll say what he said earlier this month. This is after the Fed meeting. Uh, if it becomes appropriate to tighten policy further, we will not hesitate to do that. But we will continue to move carefully, however, allowing us to address both the risk of being misled by a few good months of data and the risk of over tightening. So if there's a pushback, I think you get the pushback that you've already had, basically saying we're keeping our options open, even if you want to go ahead and think that we're not. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Let's spin the wheel and pick a Fed speaker. Let's go with President Bostick. Here's the quote. Our research and input from business leaders tell me the downward trajectory of inflation will likely continue. Jay, to his point, how much disinflation do you think is in the pipeline already that we're going to see in the months to come? Yeah, John, great question. And uh, for us, we're very focused on rents. Rents is a big factor, uh, the shelter uh, price, et cetera, in the CPI. It's been a big laggard. It's currently running at about 6 or 7% year over year. And we look at multifamily uh, building, which is off the charts. Uh, some great work done um, uh, by folks on the street about this. And so over the next uh, 6 to 12 months, we expect to see rents continue to come down. Uh, and that means that inflation is going to con continue to come down. And that means the Fed can ease. Look, we're not focused on when the Fed cuts. We're focused on why the Fed cuts. And the Fed is going to cut because it can, because inflation is going to surprise to the downside rather than to protect against the recession. There's not going to be a recession. Everybody likes to talk about it, been talking about it for 18 months, hasn't happened. Some people still talk about it. Uh, <laughs> we're not one of them, uh, thankfully, and uh, that's been the right call. We still talk about it every day, Jay, as I'm sure you know <laughs> from tuning in. Jay, that's your call on the Fed, on the economy. Now we need to talk about what's priced. Have we already priced that reality? JP Morgan really pushing back, saying this market is priced for a near perfect soft landing. What would you say back to that? Well, uh, I think the soft landing thesis is becoming proven, as I said. Uh, for, to us, we, we like to zoom out a little bit. So if you zoom out two years, the S&P yesterday closed at exactly the same level, exactly to the point where it was two years ago. So for two years, we've been digesting COVID inflation, Fed heights, et cetera. Now that's all finished. We're moving into a different regime. That regime is stability, and that allows us to think about higher prices for risk assets. The U.S. is somewhat priced for perfection. The upside is not as big in the U.S. equity market as it is elsewhere. We, two, a year ago, we were bullish on Europe. You and I talk about European banks all the time. 2023, bullish on Japan. Worked out great. 2024, we're the most positive on emerging market assets, debt and equity that we have been in years. That's where the opportunity lies. It's Goldilocks. So let's talk about the bears. Mike Schumacher, you say there's five of them. Who are the bears? 
When you think about the bears, John, really, number one is that the inflation environment really is not as cooperative as people think. So inflation, that last mile is pretty sticky. Sarah House does a lot of great work here at Wells Fargo on that. She certainly would take the lead there. Certainly think that's in play. When you consider other issues out there, China's got a lot of disruption potential. I think that's, that's a risk. In fact, one of the risks we considered thinking about the macro outlook more broadly is what if China actually surprises to the upside? So you think about the combination of inflation not really cooperating as quickly as people like. I agree with Jay, it comes down, but as it gets stuck, I think that's the big risk out there. And for me, that's the biggest bear. That's the grizzly bear. Might have found something you agree on. Jay Pulaski, China, and the prospect of an upturn through next year. What's the call? Well, John, uh, the way I've been th thinking about it is that the Chinese firecracker has a very long fuse. And uh, it's taking a while to, uh, to, to hit and to explode. We've been constructive, as you know. We've talked about it on this show. Uh, hasn't really happened yet. Been frustrating, disappointing. But our point is that China is continuing to act on the policy front. And that policy is going to gain traction. And as it gains traction, uh, equities are going to uh, perform better. China, on a valuation basis, is at a, a historic low versus the U.S. On a performance basis, at a historic low versus the U.S. Foreigners have been record sellers for the last four months. Uh, we're, we remain constructive. But look, EM is not just China. We're very bullish on Poland. We're very bullish on Mexico. We're bullish on the countries that are benefiting from the regionalization of supply chains, and those two are two of the most attractive markets in the world, uh, in our view. Jay, sit tight. Jay Pulaski, Mike Schumacher, sticking with us. About 20 minutes out from the opening bell. Equity futures shaping up as follows, pulling back by about 0.2%. With some movers, here's Abby. Let's take a look at a few of the stocks that are dragging on futures this morning, John. Starting off with the shares of Tesla. Tesla is, uh, the stock is heading to a third down day in a row. The Cybertruck launch event yesterday, of course, uh, was a big deal, but investors not liking it so much, not giving us the stock a pop, perhaps because the lowest price Cybertruck is about six. $61,000 more than expected. Dell also lower down 4.9%, uh, missing revenue by 3.2%. Plus, the fourth quarter revenue guide uh, has proven disappointing. Uh, some analysts expecting PC demand uh, to recover, though, in 2024. But right now, uh, that's really not where the focus is. And then finally, take a look at Coinbase. It is popping higher uh, with Bitcoin up about 1.4%. And uh, if you can believe it, Coinbase, uh, the stock, has tripled in 2023 with uh, the company not just surviving the crypto chaos, but really, I would say, thriving. Abby, thank you. More from Abigail around the opening bell. Coming up, a November to remember. We're heading into the end of the year. If the economic data remains OK, which we think right now it is OK, we're in a soft landing right now. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the market can continue to be in this formal world. From stocks to bonds, global markets posting a monumental month of gains. That conversation up next. Everything uh, rally remains challenged. This, this uh, FOMO rally, in a way, can continue into year end. But I think as we think about next year, we should be mindful of those two risks. Does inflation come back down enough to 2% or below to allow the Fed to cut? And does the economy hold up? It was a November to remember for the equity bulls. The S&P 500 advancing almost 9%. It's second best November since 1980. The Nasdaq 100 up double digits. That surge, part of a broader markets rally triggered by a plunge in bond yields on hopes the Fed is taming inflation without breaking the economy. But some sounded the alarm on the so-called everything rally. Mohammed al Arian of Bloomberg Opinion saying this this morning, investors and analysts risk underestimating the challenges ahead during this period of understandable market euphoria. Katie Greifard has more. Hey, Katie. Hey, John. Well, what really sticks out to me about the past month is that it wasn't just your giant tech companies that were really powering those gains. You saw a broadening out of the rally, especially if you look at the sector level. You had 10 of 11 S&P 500s sectors rally last month. Energy was your lone loser. And as you can see on the chart, the previous 
three months, only one sector had managed to post gains, and all three of those months had been losses at the index level. So decent breath to go along with that size and scope. And as you mentioned, that bullishness was really born in the bond market. Yields finally cooling off after soaring to decade-plus highs as conviction really solidified that this Fed is truly done hiking. Now, that twin rally in stocks and bonds, it produced a banner month for 60-40 portfolios as well, rising about 7.3% in November. Remember, John, that is the best monthly por- performance since 2015. And again, it follows three straight months of losses. So in everything rally, certainly the right description for this market. And to L. El- Arian's point, there are certainly reasons for pause here, but there is haven demand. It's not straight up euphoria. You take a look at gold trading near a record high. You take a look at money market funds at $5.8 trillion. Definitely uh, some safety searching behavior going on, but still a huge big rally in November. What a run in bonds and stuff. Stocks. Katie, thank you. Let's turn to the bond market and sit there for a moment. Two year, 10 year, 30 year. The move we've seen over the last month, we're talking about a 40 basis point move over one month, a 60 basis point move through November. Absolutely ridiculous, Mike Schumacher. And yet, still, even with those massive gains, this is your view that year end with 4% on a 10 year, and not year end this year, year end next year. Mike Schumacher, help us understand that why the limits of this rally takes yields down to just 4%. No, we actually think the yields go lower than that, John. So we've got yields going to 4% actually at the end of the first quarter. So we're still pretty bullish, not as bullish as we had been because the speed has been spectacular. And I think toward the end of next year, you'll get a bit more of a rally as the Fed eventually comes into ease. But really, the, the huge move, the turbocharged move, it's already happened. And the reason it kicked in, in my opinion, and Wells Fargo colleagues would certainly share this view, is su- supply fears really were mitigated back on November 1st by the Treasury's announcement that refunding would be not nearly as aggressive as it had been in August. So people said, oh, they're not going to bury us with bonds. We can actually buy some. That's good. Inflation data came out. We're pretty accommodating. That's been friendly as well. And real yields are super high. So. We think real yields come down a lot more, just to give some context on that, something like 180 on the 10-year by the end of the first quarter, down from 210, 215 today. So we do think the move continues through Q1, and then it moderates a bit from there even, John. So we're still bullish throughout the year, but I wouldn't say the speed limit's 4%. Jay, what do you think the speed limit is? Uh, John, we're not really uh, super attracted by Treasuries. As you know, we've been completely out of the Treasury market for the last three years. Uh, we did dip a toe back in last month in our model portfolios, uh, particularly at the short end, where we think as as inflation comes in, uh, the Fed able to cut. That's where there's opportunity. Ten year at 4.3 percent, broken an important technical level uh, at about 4.35, suggesting that the rate hike risk is over. So that's good, but really don't see a huge amount of upside uh, there. It's more of a coupon clipping exercise going forward than it is a capital appreciation opportunity. And so we we continue to like credit, which is where we've been exposed within our fixed income uh, sleeve. So U.S. high yield, emerging market debt, as I said, really love EM here. So EM local currency debt outperforming ag year to date by 500 basis points, as well as high yield in emerging markets. So that's where we really see the opportunity. And then when we think about rates going forward, look, our, our formula is simple. Lower inflation leads to lower rates, leads to a weaker dollar, which leads to better opportunities outside the U.S. And then the point about the money market funds, when we get to the macro stability where we're moving to, in our view, that unlocks the opportunity for that money market fund money to come back into risk assets. Money markets have taken in about $1.5 trillion year to date. There's a lot of money that as good news stacks on good news, that money is going to continue to come into risk assets and support risk assets, particularly in our view, again, outside the United States. You went exactly to where I want to go. Mike Schumacher, I want to talk about that money in money market funds, how sticky it is and what it would take to unlock it. Mike, what would it take to unlock that money that's piled up in money market funds? Probably some gets unlocked pretty soon, John, as people look at both equities and long-term yields, look at this monster move in November, and they say, hey, I'm sitting in a money market, I'm getting 5% plus 
that's nice for a year, but wow, if equities can do 9 or 10% in a month and bonds can have a terrific month as well, the opportunity cost is high. So the comfort level with moving out of money markets, out of T-bills, out of short-term super safe stuff into more risky assets, I think it's probably increasing as we speak. So there will be a lag. The retail investor is not going to really lead that process, but in our view, it starts to happen pretty quickly. So it's more comfort, a bit of performance chasing probably, but really the idea that you're not going to get blown out by yields going up in, in bond land by 100 basis points or the S&P falling 20%. Mike, any idea where that money gets recycled, where it ends up? Does it get spread equally between risk assets and fixed income? Does it go further out along the curve? How are you thinking about that? Yeah, we think more of it goes into equities and, quote, risky assets, John. So we've been thinking about really the incremental buyers of U.S. Treasuries next year. We've got retail investors buying a decent chunk. But a lot of that $500 billion we expect from retail is going to come from other sources. We've only got penciled in 100 to 100 and maybe $50 billion on a money market. So most of the money market flow, we think, probably finds a home elsewhere. Interesting. Mike, always great to catch up. Thanks for the clarity around the fixed income call next year. Mike Schumacher there mm -hmm. and Jay Pulaski, very, very constructive going into next year. We are about eight minutes away from the opening bell. Here's the setup right now for you this morning, this Friday morning, going into the weekend. Futures pulling back 0.2% on the S&P, taking a bit of a breather here in the opposite direction direction to the way we moved through November. Yields up a couple of basis points on a two-year, reclaiming 470, the 10-year high by a single basis point, back through 430 after having a little look at the 420s, 434 on a US 10-year this morning. Coming up, the morning calls and later, the path to record highs. Bank of America's Savita Subramanian making the case for 5,000 on the S&P 500. That conversation, about seven minutes away. Anyone along the equity market was totally spoiled in the month of November. To start December, we pulled back by a quarter of 1% on the S&P 500. We've talked a lot about the last month. Actually, after the close yesterday, on course for a fifth week of gains on the S&P, equaling the longest weekly run going back to June. That's the price action right now in the equity market. Let's get you some morning calls. Your first one from Morgan Stanley. Dan Grenning, Alibaba to equal weight, seeing a slower than expected turnaround and uncertainty surrounding its spin-off plans. That stock is down 1.9%. Your second call from Citi. Dan Grenning, Spotify to neutral, saying the risk reward is no longer compelling. The stock is negative by 2.1% in early trading. And your third and final call from the team over at UBS, upgrading Johnson & Johnson to a buy, growing increasingly bullish ahead of its analyst day next week. J&J &J up in a pre-market by a little more than 1%. Coming up on this program, some big calls for next year, including this one. Bank of America's Savita Subramaniam expecting stocks to hit fresh record highs next year. The price target at B of A, 5K. That conversation is coming up next. Your opening bow with futures slightly negative to kick off December is just around the corner. Leaving behind the biggest monthly gain of the year so far on the S&P 500. Let's get December started for you. About 20 seconds away from the open and bow this morning. Good morning. Equity's pulling back by 0.2% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq 100, what a stellar run over the previous month. We're negative here by 0.3%. There's your opening bow. Switch up the board and get to the bond market. Yields look like this on a 10-year, higher by a single basis point, 4, 34, 17. That's the session, November, down 60 basis points on a 10-year yield. In the FX market, best month of the year for the euro against the dollar, but we pull back 108.64. We're negative 0.2% on that currency pair. Jeff Yu, BNY Mellon, with quite a call for next year. Him and the team are looking for parity all over again on the euro. He says the ECB is going to cut first. That's the FX market. Let's turn to crude. $76 a barrel on WTI. Let's call it $75.99 to $76. We're just about unchanged on the session. 30 seconds into this session, 
We are negative 0.2% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, we're down by 03 The early mover for you, it's Dow. The company reporting weaker than expected revenue. Abby, on top of this one. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Investors really not liking this. Right now, the stock is down more than 5%. The worst day in almost a year, and it does have to do uh, with the revenue miss and the revenue guide. Now, relative to the quarter that was, uh, revenue fell short uh, of estimates by just a little bit. They put up $22.3 billion worth of revenue. The average estimate was $23 billion. And it represents a 10% fall. The quarter ahead, they are talking about revenue of about $22 billion. The street was closer to $24 billion. Now, before we feel too bad for Dell, the stock on the year uh, is up more than 88% coming into today. That has to do with the key phrase, catch phrase, AI, because they have a server business uh, that uh, powers AI, and that is still strong, but it seems as though the legacy business still matters, John. The stock, again, down 5.7%, the worst day in a year. 71.49. Abby, thanks for that. Let's turn to Big Pharma and get to a big move for Pfizer, axing development of its weight loss pill due to big side effects. Simone Foxman has this one. Hey, Simone. Hey, John. Yeah, shares down now close to 5.8%. Uh, Pfizer had been really pinning its hopes on uh, this oral weight loss pill. And this was a study of people taking this twice daily. Now, these are mild side effects in uh, medical terms, but they are pretty substantial. And when you look at the numbers, nausea, up to 73% of patients experience that, vomiting up to 47%, and diarrhea up to 25%. So the company is going to stop studying this pill for twice daily while it will continue studying it on a once daily basis. You know, all of these GLP-1 makers, these weight loss and diabetes pills, have really struggled to find a weight loss indication uh, that is able to be taken orally. And this is the real opening in the market at this moment, because if you look, 44% of Americans say they'd be interested in taking one of these GLP-1s, but that number drops to about 23% when they learn they have to take it on an injection basis. Um, Bloomberg Intelligence says this leaves Pfizer's overall obesity drug hopes in limbo, but Bank of America also said in a note today that, you know, hopes weren't particularly high for Pfizer in obesity in general, but we are looking at shares down 5.8% in a reaction to this move. Uh, just more challenges for Pfizer as they shift away from COVID, uh, the COVID era. So my thank you, I think. Sometimes you don't really want the details of those stories, do you? <laughs> that stock is up in early trading. Eli Lilly moving in the other direction. Music to the ears, I'm sure, of them. And I'm sure of Nova Nordis as well. Let's turn to Tesla. After a two year delay, the company delivering cyber trucks to customers. Ed Ludlow has this one. Morning, Ed. Yeah, good morning, Jonathan. Tesla is down 3% as it stands. The story that the pricing of the Cybertruck higher than initially marketed in 2019. We knew that would change because, A, we've had a pandemic since and the supply chain has broken down. But it is higher than what the street was expecting. Three variants of the Cybertruck. The cheapest one, a rear-wheel drive, $60,990 before any incentives or savings. But it's not going to be available until 2025. 250 miles of range all-wheel drive just shy of $80,000 available next year 340 miles of range and then the one for you John the cyber beast 99,990 US dollars before savings 320 miles of range but it can be added to the range with a range extender available this year I think the street is basically saying we don't know how this is going to go there are 1 million reservations and on one hand some people say demand is so great that the 1 million of reservations is great it's going to be a, a big product for Tesla. Others are, going to, are saying Tesla is going to control the output of it, make it a niche product, uh, make it scarce. But they're also questioning the conversion rate. Just because there are 1 million people who've put a $100 deposit down, it doesn't mean they're going to go through with buying it, particularly in light of how expensive it is. I can just about afford that smashed window decal Ed, that apparently is selling yeah. online. I want to get to this headline with you. Translate this for our audience. The US sets stringent limits on Chinese content for EV tax credits. Yes. Ed, what's going on? critically important. The threshold for a foreign entity of concern in the battery supply chain is 25% as it relates to China ownership. That means any company that has a hand in the battery supply chain, uh, be it the assembly or the components themselves, if that threshold is above 25% and they've played a role in the assembly of a battery pack, that vehicle will not be eligible for the $7,500 tax credit. These are severe and stringent limits that the Biden administration has put in place. And it now puts into question a lot of the market that's out there. 
um, and, and I think you'll see a pretty quick scramble. And I've reported a lot of this, right, John? There is a scramble to onshore so much of that supply chain uh, starting now, 2024. But just to go one further, Ed, where does it leave yeah. BYD and NEO forever coming yeah. to these shores and competing successfully? It means if they don't have a long-term plan, they need one already. But, but you know, Ford and, and Tesla are all in the same boat, right? Because uh, a lot of those that are investing in this country, and indeed North America as a whole, Canada and Mexico, are Chinese firms or ties to Chinese firms. Think, for example, CATL, and as I've recently reported, AESC. This is a pretty universal problem. But again, does it shut the door to a Chinese manufacturer coming here with a car? It's a big question. Well, the wall gets higher, that's for sure. Ed, thank you, buddy. Thanks for the catch up. Ed Ludlow there. Let's stick on China. Alibaba getting hit with a red downgrade from Morgan Stanley. Katie Greifert has this. Hey, Katie. Hey, John. Yeah, Morgan Stanley knocking Alibaba's ADRs down to equal weight from overweight, also lowering the price target to $90 from $110. Now, the logic there is that Alibaba's turnaround is proceeding more slowly than expected, and its decision to withdraw the spinoff of its cloud business, quote, brings uncertainty to the value unlocking from reorganization. Now, adding insult to injury here, in addition to downgrading Alibaba, Morgan Stanley also named rival PDD Holdings, of course, the parent company of Pinduoduo, as its top pick in China's e-commerce sector. That helped PDD overtake Alibaba in market cap for the first time ever. Now, Morgan Stanley's downgrade is Alibaba's first since about late June, and it comes amid a pretty disappointing year for the company. All told, so far in 2023, Alibaba shares lower by about 15 percent, John. Katie, thank you. We're down about 3 percent this morning. Just to get to bro the broader price action, seven minutes in, we're down by 0.2 percent on the S&P. We're down by almost 0.5 percent on the Nasdaq to kick off December after a massive month of November. Here's the outlook from Bank of America and Savita Subramaniam expecting stocks to hit a record high next year, writing this. We're past maximum macro uncertainty. With markets absorbing significant geopolitical shocks already, we're bullish not because we expect the Fed to come, but because of what the Fed has accomplished. Her S&P 500 price target of 5K among the most bullish on Wall Street. Savita, I'm pleased to say, Joins us right now. Savita, you say it's the year of the landing. Talk to me about what that landing looks like. Yeah, so I, I think that um, here's the thing. Bull markets end in euphoria, and we are far from euphoria today. If you look at allocations to equities over bonds, bond allocations are close to 30-year highs in pension funds. Um, equities are relatively lightly owned, with, it, with the exception of, of course, the Magnificent Seven. Um, so our view is that we see a broader equity market rally next year. We see uh, returns essentially move beyond just AI and tech to all of the potential beneficiaries of AI, tech, um, you know, productivity, efficiency gains that we've seen companies focused on this year. I mean, I think the idea is that we've we've seen corporates and consumers defy expectations that this quick rate hike cycle would basically crush them. And we've actually seen very strong resilience, which can be explained by the fact that corporates and consumers were essentially prepared for a higher interest rate environment already. So I think it's it's really one of these markets where you know, stocks can differentiate quite aggressively from one another. But the idea is wait until you hear that euphoria around equities. You pointed out we're one of the highs on the street. We're only looking for a 10 percent return from here. That is not outlandish, but we're still amongst the highest uh, targets on Wall Street. And I think a lot of estimates for next year are still below where we are today. So I would argue that that we're still in this sort of wall of worry type of market where everybody's worried about what could go wrong and not focused on what could actually go right. Let's get to the prospect of broader participation. Can we get profits to pick up even as GDP slows? Oh, yeah, I think so. And we've actually done the work here. Uh, we found that um, that this has happened before. In fact, in the 1950s, we saw GDP growth uh, slow three quarters after profits troughed and profits rose the entire time. We've already seen margins expanding. I mean, this is this is quite a shock to all of us, including myself. I did not think we were going to see margins expand this year with all of the cost pressure and wage pressure companies were facing. But I think that we've seen a lot of things happen this year. We've seen 
building companies basically uh, the the companies that overbuilt capacity have aggressively cut costs cut heads we haven't seen a broad spread layoff cycle so the average consumer in the US is still employed and and is actually making more money than uh, than uh, what they're paying uh, according to the spread between average hourly earnings and CPI so we're actually in a pretty good spot when it comes to corporates and consumers um, I think the next the next trigger will be realizing that consumer demand hasn't evaporated it's not falling off a cliff delinquencies are rising but only back to normal levels rather than you know into the stratosphere so I think those are the the aspects that we need to get comfortable around before investors really start taking some risk one thing you've not said rate cuts and I'm going through the outlook the research over the last month or so from you and the team Savita this line it's not about rate cuts it's about what the Fed has accomplished can you translate that a little bit more Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So we're not bullish because we think the Fed's going to aggressively cut rates next year. We're bullish because the Fed has the dry powder, five percentage points of latitude to ease our way out of the next downturn. We're bullish because we're past the point of maximum uncertainty. And you and I had talked about this a couple of years ago. It, it was, you know, in, an, in a zero interest rate environment, it's unclear how how the world is positioned for that move higher we're past that point we've absorbed two wars overseas the market has absorbed a lot of bad news we're talking about the bad news and i think that's all bullish in terms of sentiment still being uh, squarely uh, almost squeamish about really taking risk on stocks if i remember correctly when you upgraded your price target earlier this year there was a preference there a more constructive view on the equal weight s p as opposed to the market weight is that still the approach for next yes. year absolutely even more so because i mean unfortunately this year has still been relatively dominated by the you know mega cap tech up until very recently so i think that we could see this sort of broader market trend uh, continue i think the risks to the magnificent seven i mean there are seven very different companies but the risks are not necessarily fundamental but the idea that they're essentially priced for perfection expectations are high for this cohort of the market um, so we think that there are better opportunities for positive surprises elsewhere and potentially a higher possibility of disappointing news for the Magnificent Seven. So our thesis is really we're getting comfortable with the idea that you can see rates go from hyper stimulative to normal and not derail consumers and corporates. We're getting comfortable with the idea that you don't necessarily want to buy bonds at a real yield of two and a half percent for the next 10 years. That's actually pretty low. And we think that we're going to see flows and confidence improve as uh, as time progresses into next year. I remember your original price target for this year before the subsequent upgrades was 4000 on the S&P. But credit to you. I also yep. remember a conversation we had maybe 12 months ago where you said the biggest risk for stocks was upside risk. So now we're at 5K on the S&P Savita. What is the biggest risk around that for you and the team? You know, I think what worries me is not necessarily what's happening in the public equity market, but what's outside of it. So really the shadow lending and the, the, the sort of mini bubbles have been created elsewhere in private equity, private credit. And that, that seems like a slower uh, kind of a, not a car crash, but a slower headwind on risk assets that could play out over the next several years or even decades. I mean, it depends on where interest rates settle. But I think the, the worry I have is how all of that, that private funding that we've seen over the last 10 years actually impacts overall uh, consumer health, corporate health, et cetera. I don't think it's as big as the bubbles that we saw created in 2008 or 2009. So I don't think it's as systemic. But I think those are the areas where we really need to watch. And we haven't necessarily seen all of that pain play through yet. Savita, always appreciate the update. Appreciate your time. Savita, thank Likewise. you. Thank you. Savita Subramanian there of Bank of America on the year of the landing for 2024. The price target, 5K. Year end next year on the S&P 500, which as Savita says is about 10% upside from here. About 14 minutes into this session as we kick off December, we're lower here by 0.1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down by 0.3. Coming up on this program is DeSantis versus Newsom. This is a slick, slippery politician yeah. whose state is failing. Ron. You're down 41 points in your own home state. That conversation up next.
This is Bloomberg Zoop, and I'm Abigail Doolittle. You're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, an interview with Build a Bear Workshop President and CEO Sharon Price John. That conversation at 4 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. You're trolling folks and trying to find migrants to play political games to try to get some news and attention so you can out Trump Trump. And by the way, how's that going for you, Ron? You're down 41 points in your own home state. He's just throwing stuff out to see what sticks against yeah. the wall. This is a slick, slippery politician yeah. whose state is failing, people are leaving his state, and he's trying to run interference right. for his failure. There's one thing in closing that we have in common is neither of us will be the nominee for our party in 2024. Governors Gavin Newsom, Ron DeSantis holding nothing back, squaring off in a heated debate on Fox News with Sean Hannity. The two clashing over taxes, abortion, border security and energy. DeSantis looking to gain ground on frontrunner Donald Trump ahead of the Iowa caucuses. And Newsom teasing longer-term presidential ambitions. For more, let's get to AMH in Washington, D.C. Anne-Marie, who won that? Well, I think it depends really how you look at it. I think for both of these men, they feel like they walked away being able to win the minds of already the people that like them, their bases. You know, going into this, there was a lot of thinking that why would Governor DeSantis, who's on stage already for, pre for presidential debates, elevate someone like Gavin Newsom, who is not the Democratic nominee and is not going to be the nominee. And that was the line really that stood out for me when Newsom really took a dig at DeSantis, saying neither of us will be our party's nominee for 2024. But DeSantis, after the debate, said, look, I'm in a race where there's a disproportionate amount of media around one individual. Of course, that individual is the former president. So he says if he has a chance to go in front of the American people for 90 minutes and spar and what he calls box someone from the hard left, he's going to do it. It was very substantive to Jonathan in the sense that a lot of topics were discussed, but all it was was a manipulation of a lot of their facts and data to make sure that they can represent their state and their positions well. Already we know how Republicans look at California. They think it's a state of failed liberal policies, and Democrats look at Florida as a place that's rolling back a lot of social policies, especially when it comes to things like women's right to choose and abortion. MH with the latest down in Washington. Anne Marie, appreciate the update. Really do. Let's get you some data, some fresh data, just coming through some breaking news with Mike McKee. Morning, Mike. Morning, John. Well, this sets us up for the ISM at the top of the hour. The S&P Global U.S. Manufacturing PMI unchanged, basically, uh, for the uh, last couple of weeks of November. 49.4. The uh, preliminary was 49.4. Uh, last month it was 50, so a little bit of a contraction. Uh, we are expecting maybe a little bit of a pop in the ISM, a little bit of an increase because of the auto workers going back to work during the month, but we shall see at 10 o'clock. And then on to Chairman Powell an hour later. And then on to Chairman Mike Powell. McKee's, Mike McKee, it's one of those frustrating yes. mornings for you. I really know it is. It's like you've got to anticipate something that's going to happen and then spend the rest of the day talking about what happened. And hope that something does happen. Otherwise, talking about it is going to be difficult. The Chairman Powell may well stay on script. How to proceed carefully for the 1,000th time from... Chairman Powell. Mike, thank you. Let's get you some sector price action. We can do that about 21, 22 minutes into the session. Stocks down by 0.1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq down by 0.3. With that sector price action, here's Abby. Yeah, a bit of a snoozy decline here for the S&P 500. John, from a sector standpoint, we do have more sectors down than not, but not a lot of drama here, as you would like to say, or have, sometimes have said in the past. Communication services uh, down the most, down about 7 tenths of 1%, but most of these sectors down about 3 tenths of 1% or less. So the upside is so similar story. Industrials is the best, but up by about half a percent. So not a lot of conviction on the day. But what matters on the day is, even though it might be a tiny decline, it could influence the week. Because right now we are heading to another up week for the S&P 500. But fractionally, if it happens, if the S&P 500 uh, doesn't decline by about two tenths of one percent on the day, we're looking at a fifth up week in a row, the longest uh, winning streak on a weekly basis since June. Take a look at the best sectors on the week, real estate and materials as yields go down and the communications services and utilities, interesting utilities being on the downside, uh, two of the worst sectors on the week, John. Abby, thanks for the update. Coming up next on the program, give you a sneak peek at the rest of today and a sneak peek of next week as well. On the calendar, payrolls Friday. I'll bring you the estimates from our Bloomberg survey up next. From New York, this is Bloomberg.
25 minutes into the session. Here's the state of play on the session and on the week. On the S&P 500, pulling back just a touch, but still just about on course, and I say just about on course for a fifth week of gains. Positive on the week by about 0.1%. As for the NASDAQ, on course at the moment for the first weekly loss going back to October and down for a third consecutive session. The Nasdaq 100 right now, negative by 0.3%. That's the state of play currently. Let's see if all of this sticks. Let's get to the trading diary. The calendar shaping up as follows through today and through into next week. ISM manufacturing numbers coming up at the top of the hour. Plus, Chair Jay Powell headlining a busy day of Fed speak, including Goolsby and Cook. Looking to next week, on Tuesday, we get Jolt's data. Wednesday, U.S. Bank CEOs testifying before the Senate. And then the big one on Friday, the payrolls report. And here are the estimates right now in our survey. This can change, but as things stand, 190,000 is the median estimate in our survey. That is up from the previous read of 150. The unemployment rate in our survey at the moment, at least 3.9%, the previous read 3.9. More on that through next week from New York City. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. Good luck for the rest of the trading day and enjoy your weekends at home. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.